If you lived in the heart of the Milky Way, night would never be truly dark. The stars would be so close that the nearest one could fit inside our own Oort cloud, and some would streak across the sky at 24,000 kilometers per second, almost 8% of the speed of light, while orbiting an invisible black hole. Scary? Fascinating? That's the scene waiting for us, if we traded our quiet neighborhood here in the Orion Arm, for a window with a direct view of the galactic center. Long before we knew what a galaxy was, looking at the sky already hypnotized us. The curiosity of ancient observers, who told stories with constellations and marked time by the rising of certain stars, eventually became method. Admiration gave birth to astronomy, one of humanity's earliest sciences, maybe the very first. And yet, as full as Earth's night sky seems with thousands of points shining, it's only a timid sketch of what exists. Just imagine, what if, instead of living on the edges, we were at the center of this stellar whirlpool called the Milky Way? To answer that, it helps to understand the house we're in. Our galaxy is about 100,000 light years across, a disk roughly 1,000 light years thick and more than 13 billion years old. Inside that space, estimates range from 100 to 400 billion stars, an ocean of suns arranged in very different ways. The Milky Way's disk tends to look bluish because it hosts many young, hot main-sequence stars, especially of types O and B. The central bulge, that thicker bump in the middle, leans yellow-reddish, dominated by older stars, red giants, and supergiants. There, star formation is far less active than in the arms, which changes the color, the energy, and of course the sky scenery for anyone living nearby. Most of the stellar mass is concentrated within a region about 80,000 light-years in diameter. Beyond that, density drops sharply. Now, if we multiply stars, we multiply worlds. The number of exoplanets in the Milky Way is probably comparable to, or even greater than, the number of stars. And here's a detail that excites anyone dreaming of life beyond Earth. Small planets, roughly Earth's size, seem to be more common than gas giants. About one in five stars in the galaxy is similar to the Sun, and, according to Kepler data, around one in six of those Sun-like stars hosts at least one Earth-sized planet. Extrapolating, we're talking about more than 17 billion Earth-scale worlds scattered across the galaxy. Do the math of wonder. Even if a tiny fraction of these worlds sits in the habitable zone with the right conditions, we still get millions of possible worlds. So where, exactly, does our cosmic family fit into this? The solar system lives about 8 kiloparsecs, roughly 26,000 light-years, from the galactic center, in a smaller structure called the Orion Arm, a secondary spur between two larger arms. It's a quiet neighborhood. On perfect nights, with no light pollution and generous atmospheric conditions, we can spot a few thousand stars with the naked eye, around 6,000 on average. In our immediate surroundings, the sun reigns pretty much alone, within one cubic parsec, and a parsec is just over 3.26 light years, there's no companion star. It's a broad, quiet space and, by galactic standards, even empty. Now take an imaginary trip toward the center. With each parsec you move into the bulge, the stellar soup gets thicker. Once there, estimates point to something like 10 million stars crammed into each cubic parsec. Compare that to the one or even fewer in our neighborhood, and you start to grasp the scale difference. We're talking tens of millions of times more stars per volume, on the order of 50 million times denser than here. In practice, average separations between stars drop to something like 860 astronomical units. For reference, one astronomical unit is the distance from Earth to the Sun. The closest star to the Sun today, Proxima Centauri, is about 4.3 light-years away. In the center, average distances fall to just 0.4 light-years between neighbors, less than half a single light-year. It's practically a doorstep-to-doorstep -doorstep neighborhood. The sky seen from a planet in that region would be a permanent spectacle. Instead of a dark dome sprinkled with dots, you'd see a glowing fabric marked by a crowd of stars, many of them red giants and supergiants, peppered with intense rarities like wolf rayet stars. The visual density could be up to a million times greater than what we're used to, and in one patch of the sky you could pick out a small cluster of stars tracing tight orbits at absurd speeds. That's the Sagittarius A star cluster, the group of stars that dances around the supermassive black hole at the center of the Milky Way. The closest ones break speed records, reaching about 24,000 kilometers per second. It's like watching gravity in its extreme form, sculpting paths at the limit. Even with older stars dominating the bulge, the galactic center is not synonymous with calm. Astronomers have identified more than 100 massive O and B-type stars there, along with Wolf-Riot stars, 
huge, scorching, short-lived objects. OB stars are born in groups known as OB associations, and because they live fast and die young, they tend to die not far from where they were born. They pour out brutal amounts of ultraviolet radiation, enough energy to ionize the surrounding gas and create H2 regions, glowing bubbles in interstellar space. Wolf Rayet stars, in turn, have burned through much of their fuel, are shedding mass at extremely high rates, and generally started life with more than 25 solar masses. They're rare. Just over 200 have been cataloged in the Milky Way so far, but estimates suggest there are between 1 and 2,000, many hidden by dust. This mix, elder giants, short-lived stars, ionized gas, and a black hole in the middle, turns the galactic center into a turbulent metropolis. But the Milky Way isn't only disk and bulge. If you climb above the galactic plane and look toward the halo, you'll find a kind of structure that's almost the opposite of the young open clusters scattered through the arms. Globular clusters. Picture compact spheres with gravity so tightly bound they can survive billions of years without falling apart. They're much denser than open clusters, gather populations from tens of thousands to millions of stars, and have a regular shape precisely because the mutual pull among so many packed stars ends up rounding everything. Old reddish stars dominate there, and, since all the stars in a given cluster formed nearly at the same time from the same chemical brew, these systems are perfect laboratories for studying stellar evolution. When we look at a globular cluster, we're seeing a spheroid where half the light can come from within a radius of only a few tens of parsecs, an impressive concentration. In terms of density, the average can sit around 0.4 star per cubic parsec, but the cluster's core is a different story. There, the number can climb to thousands per cubic parsec. Typical distances between stars and globulars are about one light year. In the cores, they shrink to roughly a third of a light year. Do the comparison with Proxima Centauri, the Sun's nearest neighbor at 4.3 light years. That one third is about 13 times closer than our current neighborhood. And what does all this proximity mean for planets? Short answer, trouble. In the dense cores of clusters, gravitational perturbations are constant. Stars pass close enough to rattle each other's orbits. Under those conditions, planetary systems become unstable. A world orbiting its star at one astronomical unit in the core of a cluster like 47 Tucanae would probably survive for only a hundred million years before being ejected or having its orbit warped beyond what's sustainable. The good news is that on the outskirts of globular clusters, the tide is calmer. There, forming and keeping planets becomes more feasible. We've already found proof of that. The globular cluster Messier 4, for example, hosts a planetary system orbiting a pair of stars, a binary system, about 12,400 light years from Earth. And one of the worlds associated with that setting even earned a nickname, Methuselah, an exoplanet estimated to be 12.7 billion years old. As far as we know, it's the oldest planet ever identified. Think about what that implies. A world that began its story when the galaxy was still a teenager, turning patiently while countless generations of stars were born and died around it. So let's return to the question that sparked this trip. What would it be like to look up at the sky from the center of the Milky Way? You'd see a luminous, almost twilight-like dome, studded with red giants and cut by ionized nebulae, while in one spot, a handful of stars would be slingshotting around a gravity well that not even light escapes. And behind that spectacle, a practical reality would emerge. Beauty doesn't mean tranquility. A neighborhood with so many nearby stars would raise the odds that extreme events, supernova explosions, intense radiation, orbital disturbances, would interfere with the stability of worlds and, by extension, the chances of life persisting for millions upon millions of years. At the same time, it's impossible not to be captivated by the vastness of possibilities. Even far from the center, in a modest corner of the galaxy, we live with the prospect of more than 17 billion Earth-sized worlds out there. In a way, we've inherited a privileged position, not too tumultuous, not too isolated, with windows to observe and time to think. Our neighborhood, with its almost empty cubic parsec, might seem boring next to the simmering bulge. Even so, it was in this relative quiet that life had the time to learn to look up and ask questions. Maybe that's the real lesson here. The sky we see isn't the sky, but a sky. One perspective among many inside a hundred thousand light year wide home. At another address, nights would be brighter, dangers closer, and gravity's dance more frantic. Here, darkness is the backdrop for 6,000 points and a milky path crossing the firmament, our Milky Way seen from within. 
And it's precisely in that darkness that our privilege to see far resides. In the end, what would you rather have? A lookout that offers the peace to contemplate the cosmos, or a balcony with a view of the epicenter of a stellar storm? The answer might say less about where we are and more about how we want to explore everything we haven't seen yet. So, do you think there's any civilization lucky enough to have that view of the galaxy? Tell us in the comments. Thanks for watching, and see you in the next video.